being that this is a Shakespeare play and that, well, it's the most used Shakespeare play when it comes to high school drama, yeah, I was not only in one adaptation of this, but two, actually, under the same school from two different directors. Yes, I was in a stage adaptation of Midsummer Night's Dream, and I actually had a pretty big part. I played the part of Oberon, and yes, I played this exact same role in two shows. The first time was in my freshman year, and this was more of a faithful adaptation, as in we were using the actual script, the actual text, and whatnot. The second time we did this was in my senior year, and this version wasn't a faithful adaptation. The script we were using was a modern adaptation supposed to resemble... Well, the title of it was Midsummer Jersey. You can probably guess what that was about. But I still got to play Oberon, and that was cool, because I still got to say some of the same text, and I didn't have to use a stupid Jersey accent. Sorry for anyone that has a Jersey accent, I'm sorry. Anyway, this play has a personal connection for me, and yeah, I'm worried I might... I, 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 I'm gonna do my best to not have a bias in reviewing it. So, here we go. A Midsummer Night's Dream won two Academy Awards in 1935. It won Best Cinematography and Best Film Editing, credit to both Hal Moore and Ralph Dawson, respectively. It was also nominated for Best Picture. Didn't win, though, but it was nominated. Interesting story about this year. This was the last year for the Oscars to use write-in nominations. Yes, there was a time when you could just write in what you actually wanted, if you remember the Academy that was, if you didn't like any of the other nominees. And in this year, Midsummer Night's Dream won Best Cinematography as a write-in candidate, as a write-in nominee. It wasn't officially nominated, but a lot more people felt that its cinematography was good. And, well, it, it won. Sometimes I kind of wonder why they don't keep that practice. I guess it just makes things a little bit easier. This show, the reason why it's popular with high schools is not only will it give their set designers and costume designers something substantial to do in designing elaborate costumes and fantastical sets, and because it is a fantasy film, it also has a big cast, very much an ensemble cast. And it's divided mainly into three sets. The first set is the four Athenian noble lovers. We have Lysander and Hermia, who are both in love with each other, they like each other, and they want to get married with each other. The, the problem is, Demetrius also loves Hermia. Hermia's father likes Demetrius better than Lysander, so that creates a problem. And who's the fourth one? Well, that would be Helena. You see, Helena loves Demetrius, but Demetrius doesn't love her back, so therefore she's kind of left out for the most part. That's the first cast, if you will. The second cast is the Mechanicals, rather a makeshift theatrical troupe. See, there's this king of theirs named Theseus. He's getting married to Hippolyta. There's a story there that's kind of surrounded in Greek mythology. It's not really that important, except maybe in the opening scene, but it doesn't really play a big part in the story. The fact is, at the king's wedding, they're set to perform something. Give them a theatrical skit performance. So they're going to do a play called Pyramus and Thisbe. The story of Pyramus and Thisbe is a Greek story about two forbidden lovers and the whole, you know, thing in the end where they both die, showing that Romeo and Juliet is not an original story, but rather an adaptation, a different take, a modern, well, for kind of modern for its time, adaptation of the story. And I believe its presence in this play was sort of William Shakespeare giving a little wink to his followers, his fans. There are multiple characters in this troupe, and if you were in a theatrical production of this in high school or community theater or whatever, and you're one of these, you probably remember all their names. But the main focal point of this is Bottom the Weaver. He is an excited, hotshot type actor. I mean, he literally wants to play every single part in the show. But he's not. But he's cast as the part of Pyramus. Yeah, the male lover, you know? <laughs> Which features a scene where he has to... 
yeah. So this be yeah, and he's very excited, and they don't want to screw up. They don't want the audience at the wedding reception to hate it. And then we get to the fairy story. Yes, there are fairies in this show. They lurk around the forest, they live in the forest, they are part of the forest, and they're the ones that kind of connect these two together. We have three fairies that we actually care about. Yeah, there are others like Mustard Seed, Peace Blossom, and, it, and if you've ever played those characters, I'm sorry, but I'm trying to summarize this for you. So it's, it's, there's really three characters that are important, and that is Titania, Oberon, and Puck. Titania and Oberon are having a fight. The circumstances of their fight has something to do with how they wish to raise this little boy, which is a little ambiguous of how they how this boy comes about. It's not really that important. The important thing is that Titania and Oberon are fighting. And their importance in the fairy kingdom is that Oberon, the part I played, <laughs> he's the king of the fairies, the masculine part of the fairy kingdom, the fairy world. And Titania, of course, is the more feminine aspect, less aggressive, and she's the queen. So their conflict is like mommy and daddy fighting. Puck is a very mischievous fairy. So anyway, Oberon and Titania are fighting. Titania, like, says, screw you, goes away, and Oberon wants to get back at her. In the both shows I was in, that's how I was sort of directed as how that plays out. In the movie, I the direction's a little different, and I'll get to that later, because I have a little bit of a beef with that. Oberon comes up with this plan to get a hold of this flower. This particular type of poppy flower was struck by Cupid's arrow, according to their lore. And therefore, the juice of the flower, if it gets in your eyelids, once you open it, the next living thing you will see, you will fall in love, like, just lust for it. He wants to do this to Titania. Play this prank on Titania so she'll fall in love with hopefully a very hideous creature just to mess with her. The fairy that he enlists to do this is Puck. His actual name is Robin Goodfellow, but everyone calls him Puck for some reason. And in this movie, he's played by Mickey Rooney. I didn't know this at the time. I don't think I paid attention to the opening credits, but yes, Mickey Rooney, the Mickey Rooney, when he was like, I, I guess he, mu he must have been a boy or like a preteen teenage boy when he did this. Yeah, he, he's young in the movie, but he's good and he has some great facial expression, which is good for the part of Puck. Puck is mischievous. He's a jokester. He's unpredictable. You don't know what he's going to do. Anyway, Oberon and listen to help. Get the flower so that Oberon can curse Titania's eyes. Then he overhears the conflicts going on with the four lovers, primarily focused on Demetrius and Helena and wants to set those two up and decides to have Puck use the flower to make that happen. In this case, Puck tries to squirt it on Demetrius but accidentally mistaken Lysander for Demetrius, so he squirts on a Lysander, causing Lysander to fall in love with Helena instead of Hermia, and then to try to fix that, he does it to Demetrius but doesn't fix the original problem, so now there's a love triangle around Helena and Hermia's left out in the dust, so that gets screwed up because Puck, that's kind of his character, he messes everything up. As for Bottom the Weaver and the Mechanicals, how do they get connected with the fairies and this stuff? Well, Puck catches Bottom wandering off in the woods and turns his head, in, literally his entire cranial head, into an ass. Literally. Gives him a donkey face which scares off his friends, and so he's wandering off in the forest, kind of sad, wondering what to do, and runs into Titania, who is now cursed with the eyes and falls in love with Donkey Man. This is a bit of a funny show. It's a comedy. You can say the text as dramatically as you want, but overall, it's a comedy. <laughs> Especially in the very end when the performance does get performed in front of Theseus and it's one of those everything that can go wrong will go wrong and does go wrong in this show and it's pretty funny to watch despite the fact they're speaking in Shakespearean speak. But you know what? You may have hated reading Shakespeare in high school and there's a reason for that. Shakespeare is not meant to be read. Shakespeare is meant to be watched. Yes, there's stuff that you can Anal you can analyze the text. You can pretty much analyze the text of anything. It's just significant because it's Shakespeare and the, there's a very s certain way to say stuff. They say thou, s, and they speak in poetry, that kind of stuff. Shakespeare plays are more enjoyable when you watch them. 
not when you read them, when you watch them. I have a couple issues with this film, and they pretty much fall in the fairy scenes. I don't really have any trouble with anything else in this show. The thing about Shakespeare is that adaptations are different depending on how the director does it. That's just the way they're written. They're written to be open to interpretation. The way the last scene is done is different than how I remember it being staged, but that's because it doesn't have any clarifications on how it should be staged, how what the actor should be doing, why a joke is funny. It's all up to interpretation. But I do have issues with the fairy scenes. In the scene when Titania and Oberon are fighting, yeah, there's a reason why I'm putting in this in quotes, because it doesn't feel like a fight. It just feels like they're talking to each other in narration, and you know, Oberon is very stern and says it very stoically, like he's narrating a classic book for the BBC. And Titania has got a soprano voice high, and very wonderful and all that. That's something I never got from the text. I always felt like, no, they're having an argument. But it didn't feel like an argument. It didn't feel like they were having a fight. I didn't, I always felt there was tension in that scene. But there was no tension. It was just like, give me that boy. Never! Not for my fairy kingdom! See, when I did that scene on stage, both times, I had the actresses playing to Tanya slap me in the face. The first time, I actually had her slap me in the face because I didn't know stage slapping. The second time, it was a stage slap. But still, it was a fight. It was a mommy, daddy, it, it was a fight. And I didn't get that from the movie. And that's not the only problem I had with it. I feel like some of the other scenes were cut a little bit short. Once Puck starts screwing up, Oberon gets mad because, you know, Puck screws up and he's like, he's mad. He's irritated with him. And I didn't get that. I didn't get that, to, that Oberon was... Mad? Actually, I just felt the entire thing was going to plan, and Puck just had the entire thing under control, but was doing... Yeah, I didn't get a sense of care. I liked Puck, don't get me wrong, I liked Puck. I didn't like the scenes with him and Oberon, because I didn't feel like there was sort of a irritated father figure and a jokester son figure going at it. I just felt like you had this really funny comedic relief character, this shirtless little boy, talking to an exposition machine. It's like the actor looked at this text and says, I am going to speak it like this, and it's going to sound great because I'm speaking in Shakespeare. But the thing about Shakespeare is that you're not supposed to say it like you're reading it. Even if you're reading it good, you're not supposed to say it like you're reading it. You're supposed to say it like you're speaking it. And most of the other actors do that very well. You get the idea that like, you have to take your head out of it for a second and think, and think they're reading that poetic Shakespeare speak, but they're saying it like they're actually talking. That shows they have an actual understanding of the script. I didn't get that with Oberon. I don't know if that was his fault or his director's fault. So, yeah. Uh, there was that. I also felt the movie was a bit long. Or rather, maybe the director just got a little gratuitous with the fairy scenes. Obviously, with the fairies, you want to show that there's magical stuff going on. And the best way they do that in this film is showing extended scenes of the fairies dancing, moving around, and sometimes scenes of, like, two fairies dancing, as it's supposed to be symbolic of something, when really it's just, hey, look what we can show. They even sing some songs in this movie. They sing some of the lines and they put it into song, which I think slows down the movie even more. This movie is two and a half hours long. Even with the overture at the beginning, it could be cut short. I remember this scene is towards the end. It was like towards the end of Act 4. Yeah, I'm calling it Act 4 because when this play was written, it was written in five acts, and I knew that this is the end of Act 4. This, the last scene was so long. It was, it was so long because it was showing all these fairies coming together, and... Extended shots showing Oberon, and he Ellison has this cape, this black cape that goes on for like 15 feet behind him, and he has this fellow fairies uh, holding it and waving it. He's supposed to be going over to Tanya to, you know, do something magic, but it's like there's this silent or smooth, slow parade progression to it. Look, I get it. You want to make this film look beautiful in your direction. Max Reinhardt and William De 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 Turley? De Turley? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, there are two guys that directed this film. It, it just got a little gratuitous, and I felt like the scenes could have been cut a little short. If you're making an adaptation of a stage play, I get it. You 
feel like you sh you can be able to show stuff that you're not able to show on a stage. Just make sure it actually works. Make sure it actually matters. And make sure it doesn't drag the movie too long. That being said, I loved all the actors in this movie. Well, except for Oberon. I know, I know that sounds biased because I played that character in high school, but I just didn't get a sense of actual character from him. And that kind of bugged me. Even if he did, even if it was slightly directed different, I'd been okay with it if he had character, but... I just didn't feel like he had character. I just felt like he was giving off exposition. That's just how I felt with the delivery of his line. But other than that, the rest of the cast is pretty good. The ending scene is hilarious, even though I've seen it done before in different ways, and this way being different than the way I've seen it, it was still funny, and I enjoyed it. If you want to learn about this play because you're doing Shakespeare research or whatever, yes, this movie, I would say, is okay to watch. Overall, I say this film is decent, because other than that, it pretty much did the plot justice. It is very well done, some of the special effects are kind of cool, um, yeah, just a couple of things. I had issues with the fairy scenes that, and the direction of the fairy scenes that kept it from being higher, but it is a decent film. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.